I really have a distinct pleasure this morning in introducing Dr. Gertz. Uh, Dr. Gertz uh, and I have uh, been to many of these ed forums, and we've really got a great relationship. Uh, you can read his bio in your information packets, but uh, briefly, uh, he is the Professor of Art of Medicine and Chair of the Department of Internal Medicine at Mayo. Uh, he's very distinguished in many publications, and he's been a friend of the Waldenstrom's community for years and very supportive of all of us. Uh, Dr. Gertz typically gives a very strong message about healthy diet. And in every lecture that I think he's, he's had, he always has a few slides about how we should eat healthy food. And um, I don't listen to that because I eat a lot of eggs and lots of coffee. And uh, this morning I was sitting having like two cups of coffee and uh, my big, my big uh, share of eggs and, and bacon. And um, I was talking to one of my fellow board members who spied uh, Dr. Gertz this morning living up to his, uh, his lectures and, and actually doing heavy exercise, aerobic exercise. Uh, I also went over to see him this morning just to make sure, and he had a full plate of fruit and oatmeal, so he lives by what he says. Thank you. <clears throat> and eggs and coffee are not necessarily bad for you. As part of the tradition, I want to start out the way I always start out my talks. A mafia don finds out that his bookkeeper, Angelo, has cheated him out of $10 million. Now, Angelo is a deaf mute. And that's the reason why he was given the job in the first place, because the assumption was that Angelo would hear nothing, and so he'd have nothing to testify about if he ever ended up in court. So when the godfather goes to confront Angelo about the embezzlement, he takes along his attorney, because the attorney knows sign language and communicate with Angelo on the Don's behalf. So the Don asks Angelo, where's the money? And the lawyer signs appropriately to Angelo, and Angelo signs back and says, I don't know what you're talking about. And the lawyer tells the godfather, he says he doesn't know what you're talking about. So the godfather pulls out his gun and puts it to Angelo's head and says, ask him again, and if he gives the wrong answer, I'm going to kill him. And the lawyer signs to Angelo, he'll kill you if you don't tell him where the money is. So Angelo signs and says, okay, the money's in a brown briefcase buried behind the shed at my brother's house. And the godfather says to the lawyer, what did he say? And the lawyer said, you don't have the guts to pull the trigger. <laughs> So we'll start out by talking about some of the questions that commonly come up in my practice with regard to Waldenstrom's. And I'm going to actually start by talking about what I think is actually one of the more complex questions, and that is, are my kids going to get this, and does that require screening? And so that's going to require, we're going to do a little mathematics here to go through this to understand what the issues are when the risk is increased but the disease is rare. Familial disease has been reported at anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of all patients with chronic lymphatic leukemia, which isn't Waldenstrom's, but it's a disorder where there's much, much larger numbers, so it's a little easier to get a grip on. And families, first-degree relatives of patients with chronic lymphatic leukemia, will be diagnosed when they are earlier, younger, more women, and they have an increased instance of all forms of lymphomas, up to six per 100,000 persons every year. A study was done in Sweden where the first degree relatives of patients who had Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia or its histologic counterpart, lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, had a 20 fold increase, a three fold increase, a three and a half fold increase, and a five fold increase, respectively, of Waldenstrom's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, chronic lymphatic leukemia, and MGUS. Waldenstrom is about 4 per million per year, so a 20-fold rise would be 8 per 100,000 per year, and I'll go into that in a moment. 
So this is the numbers that came from this Swedish study. What they did is they studied 2,144 Waldenstrom's patients, and this 20-fold increase meant 10 patients out of the 2,144 first-of-year relatives had Waldenstrom's. Compared with the control group of 8,279, which were two patients. So let me back up and make this a little bit more digestible. Waldenstrom's is four per million per year. What that means is we could take everyone over the age of 50 in the United States and have them flip a coin. And if the coin comes up heads 18 consecutive times, that's, you get Waldenstrom's. That would be the risk. That would be four per million per year. So you'd have to toss the coin, and if it came up heads 18 times, you're one of the unlucky individuals who get Waldenstrom's. A first-degree relative, your brother, your sister, your kids, first cousins, would have a 20-fold increase. That means their risk of developing Waldenstrom's, if they tossed the coin, would be heads 14 consecutive times. So there is a substantially increased risk, but the disease is so rare to begin with that the likelihood that you're going to toss the coin heads 14 consecutive times is still very, very low. And so, yes, there is an increased risk, but that absolute risk is very, very small, 14 consecutive heads. So there isn't a yes or no answer. There's not you should or you shouldn't. But what I've decided to do in my practice, which may or may not be right, is that in patients with Waldenstrom's, I've been doing a recommendation that their first degree relatives have a simple serum protein electrophoresis blood test starting at age 50 every two years. And that's it. And it's a relatively simple test, as you know. It's a single tube of blood. It can be done as a mail in. And that's the recommendation. But again, four per million per year, 20 fold risk is 80 per million per year, eight per 100,000 per year. So it's still very, very low, albeit increased. How long will I live? That's a common question I get from every patient. Uh, newly diagnosed that I see in my practice, and of course I don't actually have the answer to that, but a couple things that you should know. That since I began in this field, the survival has more than doubled, and survival statistics, there's a lag, so you can only get survival statistics up to about 2007, 2009. And knowing what I know about the new drugs that have been developed over the last six years that have been introduced bortezomib, carfilzomib, ibrutinib, lenalidomide, everolimus, bendamustine, I know it's going to be even better than that. And so the outlook is really getting quite good for patients with Waldenstrom's. And I definitely envision that over time, this will just become a chronic disease. Curable? No. But of course, 25 years ago, AIDS was a death sentence with a median survival of four months. And, you know, Magic Johnson now is 25 years into his AIDS and is going to buy the Clippers. Um, <laughs> and he's, you know, and, 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 and Magic Johnson doesn't look emaciated to me the way uh, AIDS patients often used to look. And so with the use of multiple agents, non-cross-resistant therapy, HIV has become basically a chronic disease that you live with indefinitely, albeit not cured, and that's my vision for Waldenstrom's. Even in the old literature, when you looked at the cause of death in patients with Waldenstrom's, half of patients died of causes completely unrelated to Waldenstrom's. So they died with Waldenstrom's, but not of Waldenstrom's. And I genuinely believe that that number is going to start shrinking, again, because of the highly effective therapies. And if you look at new drug development in Waldenstrom's, it's really moving at a very, very rapid clip. So aprosimib is another anti-CD20 antibody that's been approved for the treatment of chronic lymphatic leukemia that attacks a protein on the cell surface 
that is present in Waldenstrom cells and has been used in Waldenstrom's. And then I've listed a number of agents that are under active investigation, some approved, some not approved, IMO 8400, lenalidomide, trade name Revlimid, Everolimus, uh, Carfilzomib, which is Kyprolis, Bendamustine, and Ibrutinib. You have to be careful when you look at statistics. Statistics, they're really very dangerous because when you look at statistics, usually the way these things are reported, they're reported as medians, meaning half the people will do better, half the people will do worse when they quote a median. And so, you know, there's only a limited amount of information you can get from a median. So I talk about in, in my slide height across populations. And I have to admit, I was in Japan a couple weeks ago, and I felt good because I was really tall, you know? <laughs> I'm, they're taking pictures, you know, and I'm just a giant in the crowd. And so there is no question that on average, on average, the average American is taller than the average Japanese. But how far can you take that to the individual level? In other words, if you look at the average survival of Waldenstrom's, what does that mean for me as a patient? Well, it's the same thing as what height means. That doesn't mean if there is someone from Japan standing behind that door that there's some guarantee that I'll be taller than that person. I might not be taller, or it might be someone else who's much shorter, who's an American. They're just averages, and therefore they're not relevant at the individual level. They're very good at giving information about how serious a problem is. Something that has an average survival of one year is more serious than something that has an average survival of 10 years. But that doesn't mean a disease with an average survival of one year doesn't have a fraction of patients who survive 20 years. The same thing, of course, is median income. Median income in the United States is $34,000. And what does that mean? Does that mean I can actually identify an individual and have any clue whatsoever how much they make? You can't possibly know that. You just know averages. And I know that the average income in the United States is higher than the average income in Mexico. So if we randomly pick someone from each country, it's probable that the one in the United States probably earns more. It's dangerous business, though, because there's always the possibility that you'll you know, get a banker or something like this from Mexico. And so don't overinterpret the averages. You just can't take them very seriously because they just don't translate at the individual level. So people ask also, what? can I do to live longer? And you know what? Ron hinted at it. There are things that you can do. Um, there's not a, it's, and it's not medicine, and it's not taking mega doses of vitamin E or fish oil capsules. Uh, living longer is an issue of lifestyle. It was just a publication just in the last week showing shorter survival for estrogen receptor positive women with breast cancer who were obese. And this is based, I mean, on 100,000 women. So it's big numbers to suggest that for whatever reason, their weight, their body mass index was predictive of outcome. And so although it may not affect the sensitivity of Waldenstrom's to the various treatments, it does go to how resilient you are, how well you can tolerate the treatment. As you know, these treatments often will affect the normal blood counts. And I found in my practice that individuals who are infirm and very frail don't seem to tolerate the normal doses that more robust individuals, they can't tolerate as much. The effect on the normal blood counts is greater. And so, maintaining an active lifestyle, maintaining activity. I read in the, in the um, brochure that there was a morning walk or a morning yoga or this morning. I mean, that's just a great idea. And I actually applaud the society for having a breakfast that wasn't hash browns and sausages, but included fruit, whole grain oats, skim milk, and I think those are things that you can do. Remaining trim, remaining active. 
Another thing about obesity and chemotherapy is the way in which we dose chemotherapy is based on a measurement called uh, per meter squared. We actually do it based on your body surface area, which is a measurement based on your height and weight. And I can tell you that in patients who are obese, these measurements of chemotherapy dosing really get to be very, very inaccurate. And so we don't have very good standards on dosing of chemotherapy for extremely heavy individuals. And so it becomes a bit of a, a guess. Uh, and you don't want people guessing about your chemotherapy doses because those guesses could result in under-treatment based on the drug distribution, or it can result in over-treatment, which could magnify the side effects that you receive from your treatment. And then there's a new concept that's emerging, and that's frailty. And frailty is being used a lot in our cancer literature. And frailty is measured by questionnaires, activity level, the presence of other heart, lung, or liver problems, and kidney problems. And in some studies, frailty, this terminology, seems to predict uh, decreased survival independent of the status or type of cancer. Next question. Will my Waldenstrom's transform into something worse? Will it become more aggressive? So Richter's transformation, which is the term that's often applied, was first used in the description of patients who have chronic lymphatic leukemia. And that chronic lymphatic leukemia turned into a more aggressive form of lymphoma. And the type of lymphoma is DLBCL, diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma. That's the type of lymphoma that can occur in Waldenstrom's patients after a period of time, and it's a more aggressive form of lymphoma than Waldenstrom's is. And it's not a totally, completely new occurrence. Genetic studies of the population of lymphoma cells show that it's almost certainly derived, this large cell lymphoma, from the Waldenstrom's population. They're actually identical. And probably what happens is that Waldenstrom cells over time mature from a probably stem cell of Waldenstrom's and it matures into the Waldenstrom cell. And something happens that blocks this maturation so it can't mature all the way into the Waldenstrom cell. It's arrested in an earlier phase at a, as a more aggressive lymphoma cell. And the estimate of risk depends on this trial, the study, the populations that is looked at, but roughly runs about 6% of patients with Waldenstrom's. Now earlier, the question has been raised that purine nucleoside analogs such as fludarabine or cladribine, 2CDA, may increase the risk of the development of this large cell transformation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The second thing that can occur is that the cells of the bone marrow that grow into the red blood cells and the white blood cells, the infection-fighting white blood cells, and the platelets, which those of you who know me, I'm talking about the seed cells, of the bone marrow actually can get damaged by chemotherapy. The weed killer damages the healthy normal seeds of the bone marrow and after a long period of time can result in the development of what's called MDS or myelodysplastic syndrome. And what's thought to occur there is that certain forms of chemotherapy can damage the seeds, they actually damage the chromosomes in the nucleus of the cell, damage the DNA that makes these seeds sick and they can't mature and can't give you healthy red blood cells that carry oxygen, healthy white blood cells that fight infection, and platelets that clot your blood. And the estimate of that is between 1 and 3%. 
Probably the best trial that I saw was published last year by a French group, Dr. LeBlond is a well-known Waldenstrom's researcher, where patients were treated either newly diagnosed with either fludarabine as a pill or chlorambucil as a pill. Uh, chlorambucil in this country is Lucaran. And they looked at the risk of second cancers and the risk of the Richter's transformation to the development of this diffuse large cell lymphoma. So first was the risk of second cancers. And fludarabine had a risk of second cancers at eight years of 4%, which I don't consider particularly high, and that's a very long time for this to develop. Chlorambucil, on the other hand, had a risk of second cancers of 21%, uh, which isn't trivial, and I think has led a lot of doctors who care for Waldenstrom's patients to minimize their use of chlorambucil or Lucaran, except for patients where it's deemed that the risk of developing this problem is low. And then in B, the lower curve, that's the Richter's transformation, the development of higher grade lymphomas. And the risk with fludarabine, again, at eight years was 7.7%. And in the chlorambucil treated group was 11.1%. So it's not insignificant, but one must keep in mind that this business with transformation into a large cell lymphoma can occur without treatment. Patients with chronic lymphatic leukemia and Waldstrom's can develop Richter's transformation even if they've never been treated before. So I've seen patients, small numbers fortunately, who are on watch and wait, yet they develop this large cell transformation many years down the line. And so it's, there's a predisposition that's already there that might be enhanced by some of these chemotherapies, but it's not all due to the chemotherapy. It's part of the natural biology of Waldenstrom's. Will I be disabled? And I would say for the overwhelming majority of patients, this really is a no. When you look at the side effects of the disease and the side effects of treatment, usually what you see are problems related to their blood counts, and most of the time, that usually relates to a low red blood cell count, therefore being anemic, and so therefore maybe a little bit of shortness of breath, climbing a couple flights of stairs, or less energy, can't play as much tennis perhaps, but usually mild effects. And problems related to enlarged lymph glands, enlargement of the liver, enlargement of the spleen are really relatively uncommon in modern practice. So that type of disability is uncommon. Peripheral neuropathy is a problem. And there are two issues there. First of all, patients who have IgM, monoclonal proteins, the Waldenstrom's protein, do have a significant risk of developing nerve damage in their feet, numbness, tingling, burning, weakness related to the protein itself. Not a high percentage of patients, but it's part of the natural history of some of these proteins that they can damage the nerves. But there also is a treatment-related risk of nerve damage. Some of the treatments that we use for the management of Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia can produce significant nerve damage. And in my practice, that actually has a profound influence on treatment selection because patients are destined to do so well with this disease, I'm very scrupulous to avoid agents that may produce long-lasting effects that patients will have to deal with for many, many years. So neuropathy is something to be aware of. Occasionally, this is rare, this is probably under 5%, kidney complications can develop in Waldenstrom's. Patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia occasionally can develop problems with their kidneys that can lead to impaired purifying ability of the kidney so it can't cleanse your bloodstream correctly. And occasionally, occasionally, 
Patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia can develop a very rare complication called amyloidosis that can affect the kidney, and that leads to problems with swelling and fluid retention and purifying problems. And finally, patients with Waldenstrom's can develop a syndrome called cryoglobulinemia, where the protein itself actually gels in the bloodstream, and that can cause problems with the skin, easy bruising, easy bleeding, uh, circulatory problems to the legs, and kidney problems, again, causing inflammation in the kidney, which can lead to fluid retention, high blood pressure, and impaired ability to cleanse the blood. So what are the complications that can be seen? This comes from Dr. Kyle's um, really classical work on patients with IgM proteins. And basically, in patients who develop IgM proteins, IgM muguses, of 430, only 71 actually developed Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and that's 20 years of follow-up, or 17% of patients who had an IgM monoclonal protein developed Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. 14% developed a lymphoma that is very, very similar to Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And then you have a small percentage of patients um, that developed other rare problems. And I think the key here is that even with 20 years of follow-up, the majority of patients who had an IgM monoclonal protein did not develop a more serious problem. They remained stable over time. They did not require intervention. And I think that reflects the very favorable biology of these disorders, the fact that they're very slow growing and slow to evolve. And among patients with IgM monoclonal proteins at 20 years, what you can see here is that the ratio of IgM, MGUS, to Waldenstrom's was 4 to 1. So the overwhelming majority of patients did not develop Waldenstrom's. That's a very important message for those of you who are here with IgM, MGUS, who are on watch and wait. This is also from his article, just to give a sense of what is seen in terms of complications of Waldenstrom's. Now, in this trial, a quarter had an enlarged liver, 20% had an enlarged spleen, and only 17% had enlarged lymph glands. And I would venture to say that these numbers are probably overestimates of what we see today, because we're tending to see patients referred much, much earlier and this trial goes back a ways. And so we're seeing patients, boy, I'll bet in my practice no more than 10% of patients have an enlarged liver by physical examination, and less than that have an enlarged spleen. And enlarged lymph nodes, yeah, you see, but it's probably no more than about 10% in modern days. But notice that 5% of patients did have peripheral neuropathy, that numbness and tingling in your hands and feet, and uh, half of those patients didn't even have Waldenstrom's. They just had the IgM monoclonal protein, and it caused nerve damage without actually being Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. This is just some numbers to kind of look at what you see with Waldenstrom's. That's column 2, WM. And you can see patients with WM are more anemic, lower hemoglobin, lower red blood cell count, than other patients with IgM proteins with no difference in the white count and substantially higher levels of IgM. That M protein is the IgM of 4.3. And for those of you who follow the IgM, that would be an IgM of 4,300, roughly, uh, as an average for patients. So anemia would be probably the number one reason why we see patients nowadays and still continues to be the number one presenting symptom. A lot of times people call me and say, I notice that when I get my immunoglobulins, my IgM level is high, but there are two other levels that 
that uh, are in there in IgG and in IgA that are low, should I be concerned? And the answer is it's extremely common for patients with Waldenstrom's to have a reduced IgG. In this, only 31% of patients had a normal IgG, so 69% were abnormal. And a normal IgA, uh, abnormal IgA was present in, in 20%. So it's important to recognize that all patients, or most patients with Waldenstrom's, have reduced IgG and IgA, and it should not be a concern. These, what they call technically uninvolved immunoglobulins, the GNA, generally are incidental findings. They don't require therapy. They are not associated in the overwhelming majority of patients with increased or recurrent infections, and they're not a concern. And in my practice, after the initial evaluation, where I measure the M and the G and the A, I stop measuring the G and the A. After the first evaluation, I just follow the M. There's no point in following the G and A because it doesn't normalize, and usually, even with very effective therapy, it remains low. Finally, hyperviscosity. Hyperviscosity is a unique feature of Waldenstrom's. Uh, I'm happy to say that it's an extremely rare complication of Waldenstrom's. It only occurs when the IgM level is very high, and usually it would really be uncommon to see it with an IgM level under, of, over, of under 5,000, excuse me. If the IgM is under 5,000, hyperviscosity is highly unlikely. And again, for those of you who are new here, hyperviscosity is the IgM in the plasma, making the plasma very thick and viscous, Instead of flowing like water, it flows like maple syrup, if you will. And that can cause problems, primarily nose bleeding and gum bleeding, and occasionally bleeding in the retina or the eye. And viscosity is now a very uncommon complication of Waldenstrom's, seen in about 15% of patients in that era. And I would venture to say that symptomatic hyperviscosity today is about 5%. Should I be tested for MYD88L256P? Should I get the genetic testing? To show you how controversial this is, what I have there is the agenda of the International Waldenstrom's meeting that will be held in London in August. There's a presentation from Dr. Liu and Dr. Trian's lab about testing the peripheral blood for MYD88 for the diagnosis of Waldenstrom's. And then among the experts, there is a debate that will be held that specifically is asking the question, should MYD88 be tested? So even among the experts and the specialists, this has not been answered as to whether you should have MYD88 testing. So you have one group led by Dr. Lelou who believes it should be tested, and then one by Dr. Kimby who believes that it should not be tested. And then on Sunday, August 17th, there's going to be a task force for updating recommendations for diagnostic workup that's specifically tasked to address whether MYD88 should become part of the standard. So at this point in time, even among the experts, there is no answer that I can give you about whether you should or should not have MYD88 testing. However, today, if you look at the diagnostic criteria of Waldenstrom's, and I think Dr. Kyle led the last group about what constitutes a diagnosis of Waldenstrom's, MYD88 is not required for the diagnosis. The clinical outcome of MYD88 is still not clarified. There's been one group that suggests there is a different outcome between those who are positive and the 10% who are negative, but it hasn't been validated in a large group of patients as a prognostic factor. So we can't say that MYD88 is predictive of the clinical course or the outcome. None of the therapy trials that are currently available in Waldenstrom's 
are arguing that the treatment depends on your MYD88 status. So whether you're MYD88 positive or negative, there are none of the trials that say if you're positive you should get this treatment or not. So it has no impact on the selection of therapy at this time. If you look at patients with IgM, MGUS, they also have MYD88 mutations. So it doesn't even help in figuring out whether you have an MGUS or Waldenstrom. So it doesn't impact treatment. It's unclear what the effect is on prognosis. And it doesn't distinguish Waldenstrom's from IgM mugus. And before I came, I took a look to see if Mayo Medical Laboratories, which is the second largest commercial laboratory in the country, offers MYD88 testing commercially. And the answer is no. It's not offered commercially as yet. And believe me, if there was a buck to be made, we'd be doing the test. <laughs> and that suggests that the demand for this right now, I mean, can we do it? Yes. Dr. Ansel's laboratory at Mayo, Dr. Trion's laboratory have the facility to do the MYD88. And we are capturing that information in our patients so we can try to understand the biology of the disease and try and understand if it makes a difference. But in your local doctor's office, should it be done? I'd say right this minute, I'm not prepared to make a recommendation that MYD88 testing is clinically relevant. Next question. What are the triggers for starting therapy for Waldenstrom's? When should I be treated? When should I be watch and wait? And so probably the best two articles are from the second international workshop on Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia and, of course, the Mayo Clinic recommendations. And the consensus there is that treating patients with Waldenstrom's is only appropriate for patients with symptoms. And what are identified as symptoms? Fevers, night sweats, symptomatic fatigue due to anemia, symptomatic fatigue, not just anemia, you have to have, the anemia has to mean something, you have to be symptomatic from it, or weight loss. Progressive enlargement of lymph nodes, progressive enlargement of the spleen were considered reasons to begin therapy. The consensus group also said that the presence of anemia with a hemoglobin level of 10 grams per deciliter or lower, men and women both, or a platelet count under 100,000 due to Waldenstrom's involvement of the bone marrow would potentially justify treatment. So there's some numeric thresholds that you can actually look at based on expert consensus review to decide whether treatment is appropriate or not. If those are not present, there are certain rare reasons why treatment should be initiated. And that includes the hyperviscosity syndrome, which I mentioned is present in 5% of patients. Patients who have peripheral neuropathy that's really bothersome to them could be indications for therapy. And then the development of those rare problems. Amyloid, which I'm not gonna talk about because it's so rare. Waldenstrom's complications of the kidney, which are also rare and cryoglobulinemia, which is rare, but is a justification for therapy. So those are really the current indications for therapy as both recommended by the International Workshop Recommendations, which is global expertise, and secondly, by the Mayo Clinic Waldenstrom's uh, study group. So then the question comes up, what do I need tested when I see my provider? So I see a lot of patients for second opinions and they say, okay, uh, I'm about to go back to my home doctor. What do I need to keep monitoring on? And of course, what's being monitored depends on whether you're watch and wait or you're previously treated but now not on active treatment or whether you're on active treatment because the measurement and the frequency differs between active and inactive management. So patients who are on watch and wait or who've been previously tre treated the things that need to be watched is the hemoglobin level because anemia is one of the reasons why we treat patients. In those consensus guidelines, it said less than 10. So hemoglobin is a critical measure. The platelet count is a critical measure because if it drops too low, it can cause easy bruising or bleeding or can actually make the treatment a little bit more complex because there's not enough healthy bone marrow reserve to easily treat patients. 
I also measure the M spike in the serum. That's the peak on the serum protein electrophoresis. And I measure the IgM. And it's unclear whether immunoglobulin free light change should be measured routinely in patients with Waldenstrom's. I will tell you that I do measure it in my practice, but even though I've been doing that for a number of years, I'm unclear as to how much additional value it provides in terms of making decisions about whether a watch and wait patient should be treated or whether a patient who'd previously been treated needs to resume therapy. And then I monitor liver, spleen, and lymph node size, and I don't do that with any x-rays or CAT scans. I don't do that as a routine part of my practice. I do that by a thing called the physical exam. I actually, yeah, sometimes I actually have patients get undressed. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, no, I'm not sick. <laughs> but generally speaking, the finding of spleen and lymph node enlargement on an x-ray or a CAT scan or a PET scan that I can't feel is more often than not not clinically important. For patients who are on active treatment, really you, the, the clinician has to ask themselves, what was the reason why I treated them the first place? Why did I treat you to begin with? If I treated you for anemia, then I'm following for anemia. If I treated you because of big lymph nodes, I'm following the big lymph nodes. If I treated you because of hyperviscosity, I'm following that. If I treated you because of cryoglobulinemia, I'm following that. And so that metric is driven by what was the reason you were treated in the first place. And then of course, I add to that measurements of the IgM level and the M spike. Now notice through all that, there's nothing in there about a bone marrow because regarding surveillance, I do not routinely need or use bone marrow examination to know where I am. The IgM level, the M spike, the light chain are such sensitive markers of the activity of Waldenstrom's, I don't need a bone marrow. I do do one when I'm starting treatment or resuming treatment but if I'm monitoring and I'm not treating, I don't have a policy of, well, I do a bone marrow once a year. I just don't do that. I don't find that it contributes to my understanding of what's going on with the Waldenstrom's beyond what I'm learning from the measurement of hemoglobin, M spike. And those of you who've seen me know, I don't do very many bone marrows because I can figure it out without a bone marrow. Is rituxan alone a good treatment? And this is a uh, study looking at 69 patients who had Waldenstrom strictly divined, who got four doses of rituximab. And the IgM fell by 50% in 28% of patients, and it fell between 25 and 50% in 25% of patients. And we call that the clinical benefit rate. So the clinical benefit rate with rituxan alone was 52%. And I think that's not very good. I just don't think a 52% response rate in today's modern era is a very good response rate. And so I generally don't use rituxan alone in my practice. I see a lot of patients who got rituxan alone. Half of them probably didn't need treatment in the first place that I see. Half of them the ones that did need treatment didn't respond and need something more anyway. And so it's just something I don't use unless the patients have something unique like peripheral neuropathy only. If that's the only thing they have, I'll use rituxan. But if they're developing problems with progressive anemia in large nodes, I don't think rituxan alone is a good enough treatment because it works half the time. And just to give you a comparison, that trial in Europe showed that fludarabine had a response rate orally of 48% and chlorambucil had a response rate of 39%. And I think adding other agents to rituxan is a much better way to address this. And in fact, most combination treatments of rituxan plus something else, whether that's cytoxin or bendamustine or velcade or carfilzomib, you expect response or CHOP, 
between 80 and 90 percent. And so I don't think rituxan alone is a very effective therapy for the management of this disease. How deep a response do I need? How far does the IgM have to go down for me to say, hey, this is good? And I have to admit, this is also a very controversial topic. Different experts have different philosophies about how much the IgM should go down to consider it effective treatment. I'm kind of a hands-off kind of guy, by and large. And I'm not very clear that if the IgM, let's say, went down 20 or 30 percent, but the reason why you were treating lymph node enlargement or anemia or low platelets improved significantly that I care very much about the IgM. I'm more interested in the clinical endpoints, the reason why I started treatment in the first place rather than the absolute level of the IgM. There are some patients where the IgM will go down only a modest amount and then level off, and patients feel great. Their hemoglobin goes from 9 to 11, or their platelet count goes from 80 to 130, or their lymph nodes shrink away. And quite frankly, with this type of chronic disease, if their clinical symptoms abate and they're feeling better, I'm not overly focused about the level of IgM. And this is a big deal because I get calls every week from physicians who say, well, my patient's IgM only fell 30%. What should I do next? And I'll say, why did you treat them? Oh, their hemoglobin was 8, and they were needing blood transfusions. And what's the hemoglobin now? And they'll say, 11. I go, pretty good. I think this would be a time to watch and wait again. There's no need to over-focus on that number, keep an eye on the hemoglobin. And so I think that's a relevant issue. Should I get a second opinion? I wrote a little thing in the torch. I have to admit I'm biased because I'm a guy who gives second opinions. <laughs> but I will tell you this. I drive a Camry. I take my car to the dealer because I like the person taking care of my car to have a lot of experience with Camrys, a lot. Not general experience, but Camry experience. I also have an Accord and I take that to the Honda dealer because I like knowing that my car is being handled by someone who has lots and lots of experience with Hondas and Toyotas. So when it comes to my own medical care, I feel an obligation to treat myself as well as I treat my car. And so if I have a highly specialized rare problem, I'm not going to the general mechanic I'm going to the person who really knows most about my car. What about maintenance rituxan? What the heck is the deal with maintenance rituxan? Every doctor I ask tells me something different. And that's because the results that have been published are different. There's one observational study where rituxan maintenance was associated with improved outcomes, but they had more frequent infections. Regrettably, no quality of life measures were done because it's really important when we're talking about this to optimize quality of life. And you want to know, is your quality of life better with rituxan or without rituxan? They did a survey in the Netherlands. They just asked all the doctors who treat Waldenstrom's whether they recommended maintenance therapy for their patients. And in the Netherlands, where they did the survey, maintenance was recommended by 23% of the doctors. And then they asked the doctors, okay, you recommend it. Do you actually, did your last Waldenstrom's patient get maintenance rituxan? And the answer was yes, in 8.5%. So at least in the Netherlands, there's not an overwhelming enthusiasm. There was an important review done by the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence on the question of maintenance rituxan, and they considered it impossible to draw firm conclusions regarding the clinical effectiveness of the intervention. And that was a 2013 article. So 
based on the 2013 data, it's actually still a toss-up for Waldenstrom's. Now, there are other lymphomas where rituxan maintenance has been used, follicular lymphoma. And so basically, I circled one trial that's listed there of 387 patients who got CVP therapy, which is a form of chemotherapy, and then got maintenance rituxan four weeks, or four weekly doses every six months for two years. And when they looked at survival, and when they looked at the time without active disease, there was no significant difference between the groups. Admittedly, follicular lymphoma is not Waldenstrom's, but there isn't enough Waldenstrom's patients to ask the maintenance rituxan question. So sometimes you look at things that look like Waldenstrom's. And so we look at follicular lymphoma, and when we look at follicular lymphoma, we can't really see a clear-cut benefit with maintenance rituxan. I'll tell you that the German Lymphoma Study Group is doing a massive trial of rituxan maintenance therapy that I hope will be a definitive answer to this question. But at this point in time, I can't endorse it or condemn it. My last slide. What's the deal with abrutinib? And the answer is that abrutinib is approved for chronic lymphatic leukemia. Patients who received one prior treatment. And the therapy that's approved is a standard dose of 420 milligrams daily for two years. So as it's approved, it's for a limited duration of therapy, not abrutinib forever, but the approval is for two years of abrutinib. That doesn't mean it's right, that's what's approved. And what do we know about abrutinib? Regrettably, all we know is the response rate. We don't know how long the responses last. We don't know what the impact on overall survival is. But this is the data we have for Waldenstrom's. The best overall response rate, which, in, which is the clinical benefit rate, is 81%. The major response rate, which is a 50% reduction in the IgM protein, is 57%. So it's not a miracle. It's effective. It's very active. These patients have had a lot of prior therapy, but the major response rate is 57%. It's not 100.0%. It doesn't cure Waldenstrom's. It doesn't, it's not effective in every single patient with Waldenstrom's. One thing that's good about it is that it's very fast acting, and that the average time to get a response for those patients who do respond is only four weeks. So it's very rapidly acting, and as a consequence for patients who have had a lot of prior therapy where there's an urgent need for IgM reduction, abrutinib is effective. But in terms of how long is it going to last, how long I should take it, and what will the impact on survival, it simply isn't known yet. So I think I've used up all my time, and I think I used up any time for questions. So I think I'll, I'll just stop there, and maybe I can, should I, I'll do questions during Ask the Doctor. Ron?